uh, one of my folks yesterday um, or this morning mentioned, you know, not all of us want to be on camera uh, for whatever reason, but it might be nice if we were to do this, if you could get a still shot of everybody who is presenting. So we at least know, we can at least put a face with the name because in some cases, uh, you know, there's people that are briefing that we don't know or, or you know, haven't seen in a long time and lose facial recognition. So maybe if we could get a still shot of, of somebody to put up there while they're briefing or, or, you know, the beginning of their brief or something like that, that would be helpful. Matt? Yes, sir, Dave. Um, sorry, I was a couple minutes late. I was otherwise detained, as I know a lot of us are these days, uh, with domestic logistics. Um, can Randy, to your point, can you see any still folk people? And I would, I guess, like I could see Mike Robinson's here. Um, and I'm wondering how much of this still photo that does show up on some people might be maybe an internal miter thing because it's uh, because this Teams was was set up uh, through the courtesy of miter. Can you see any still photos of anybody at all? Um, I can't. Yeah, I can't, but other people said they could. So I'm not real sure, you know, if it's a you know, FAA thing going through, you know, our firewall or exactly what it was. Um, you know, when, when Matt talks, I can see him um, and I can see Matthias, but at other times, you know, I couldn't see people, but yet others told me they could. So I, I don't know if that's, you know, a, I, a Microsoft thing, you know, Microsoft Teams thing or an individual issues. I, I have no idea why that's like that. Well, so, Randy, well, this the video of question for you. Did you use the web browser version or did you use the app? Because I used the app on my FAA computer and I was able to see people that were talking if they had their camera turned on. Yeah, then maybe that's it then because I was using the uh, browser. Yeah, I used the app. Yeah, and and that, that that's a great point. Uh, we've had we've had much much better success with uh, the video aspects of this, uh, with people using the app versus uh, the, the web browser. And on the web browser side, we heard from people that uh, using Google Chrome worked, whereas Internet Explorer did not work from that perspective. And I guess that's what I was trying to get a read on a little bit because. Um, as we've been experimenting with um, uh, some of these various uh, teleconferencing systems, uh, some work uh, with browsers, some don't, some work in the FA, some don't, and some work external and some don't. So uh, I think for, for future reference, we're just trying to get some data points here so we can uh, see. But um, I, it was interesting, Matt, I don't know if you ever saw the comment yesterday, uh, Maryland and Pearson and uh, Alfred neither one could get video to work the streaming at all so they were not able to see presentations or anything at least early on in the day i didn't follow up with them later um and i did ask them about if they were doing it through the browser or with an app and i suggested they download the app and, and try it through that but i never heard back so just another data point but, no, but we appreciate the feedback <laughs> <laughs> I'll bet you that was Marilyn. <laughs> so yes, it was. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Echoes from the bunker, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> So while while Marilyn's getting her audio squared away, um, uh, I, I guess um, I guess back to you. Okay.
Well, it, it's good to hear your feedback and get a sense of how you felt like it, it worked. We certainly heard from some people by email. We saw some feedback in the chat room and, and that was much appreciated. And as, as Randy said, I also miss the, uh, the personal interaction with people because I think there's a lot of benefits from seeing each other in person during coffee breaks, have time to chat or afterwards over a beer or dinner to, to have additional opportunities to, to engage in, in conversations. So I, I miss that. <clears throat> I also appreciate Bruce's comments of if you start mixing in person with remote access, that brings some challenges with us. And so we'll have to keep that in mind. But I think also technology has advanced to a certain degree that may be helpful too. And for that matter, uh, thinking into the future for planning for future meetings, uh, Let's see, can I share maybe my desktop, uh, Matt? I may just grab it here, see if that works. I hope so. You're, you're, you're a big guy, you can do that. There you go. Uh, I, I don't go it into the uh, presentation mode so that I can actually jump around and, and type into it. Can you see my desktop here? Yes. Good. So this is where we stand in terms of future meetings. Uh, you heard yesterday uh, the update on the NBA challenges and that we had to look for other uh, more financially viable solutions. And so this is how it looks currently that we have a slot uh, in the Santa Green facility uh, at NCAR here in Boulder for 14 and 15 October that we have the large uh, conference rooms there that we can utilize for an FPA in-person meeting. And given that we are at NCAR, we might have some opportunity to also enable remote access uh, more easily than we could at the uh, NTSB or the NBA locations. Now, having said all this, obviously we are still not clear how the situation will evolve and whether we will be able to have an in-person meeting or whether we continue to be on some sort of uh, working from home, uh, social distancing uh, environment and may not be able to travel. So stay tuned, we have to see how this is evolving. But I think we can hold on to the dates, we can do the planning for it, and in a worst case, we may have to nudge the agenda again to accommodate four time zones, and that may you know, have some influence of how it will actually play out. Then looking further ahead, the 21 FPA spring meeting, we hope to be back in Washington DC in person at the NTSB conference facility and I hear from Don Ike, and thank you so much that the NTSB continues to offer the facilities for our usage. We just have to work around the NTSB's own usage of the facility in finding dates, and so that will be somewhere probably late March through maybe early May in that time frame. We will try to identify some. <clears throat> and then the fall meeting in 21, uh, Matt mentioned that yesterday already that Heather Reeves at NSSL in Norman, Oklahoma has offered the facilities there. And so we have already essentially uh, laid out a few opportunities down the road. And should there be financial situation changing and we get significant sponsorship, that would certainly open the door again to participate with the uh, NBAA business aviation, uh, go with them either in Las Vegas or Orlando. So we want to definitely keep that door open, but it would, would require substantial financial support. And that has been a challenge in the last several years to, to really get enough towards that. Um, so we just see how it goes. So that's where we are. And then from previous planning meetings, we have some leftover topics that uh, we uh, sort of penciled in here. Looking at the fall meeting, we talked earlier 
about having a winter weather focused uh, topic, and it's probably a half day session. And Josh Powers has been uh, spearheading this, and we tried to make it a little broader than what where he was coming from initially, focusing on runway friction. Oh, I get a sign here. My connection is back. Can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? I can okay. still hear you. I can. Okay, because I got a sign here. I'm on the shoestring of an internet, and so I'm trying to to make it work. So anyway, uh, we had a placeholder here on the winter weather uh, for the fall. And then given that we couldn't do the all day uh, federal review of aviation weather activities, uh, we moved that essentially one year out in the hope that we can do that in person again in Washington DC. So that one is there. So this is what we had. And then obviously we have the opportunity through the website to submit topics. And this opportunity hasn't been utilized to its fullest extent, and we would like to encourage you to do that. And maybe it's also an action item for us to be more proactive and remind people that we are soliciting input for topics. But despite that, uh, I put a list together with some topics that have been floating around in my head or other people's mind. And so this is just a, a list of things that we could engage with. And so in some ways, I without rather than reading through the list, you're much faster doing that than I can go through this. But you see it, and I would like to open the mic to solicit feedback, feedback from you to see what kind of things resonate with you and uh, who would want to run with one thing or another. I'm not sure. Are you done, Steve, or are you still talking and I just can't hear you? No, I'm, done. I'm done. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, you were actually one of the people who were, you know, following the protocol and submitting a, a topic on this. And so we duly noted that. So uh, there's clearly an opportunity to provide updates along those lines. But I could also see like what we had uh, in yesterday's session, a lot of discussions about uh, weather observations. And we focused primarily on on surface observations, but I could also see going, you know, broader on the opportunity of airborne and space-based observations. Matt, I see that you want to say something. No? Okay. <clears throat> Other sentiments from? Uh, Matthias, this is uh, Matt Tucker. Yeah, uh, Matt. And, uh, Going along with uh, Steve's uh, SC206 stuff, uh, Rocky Stone, myself, and Eldridge Fraser have been working on CDM in the cockpit, uh, kind of expanding the whole CDM role, including the pilots. And uh, we think uh, come October, uh, the service uh, description that we're working on should be mature enough to actually uh, even do a panel uh, reference that and I think Eldridge is actually going to submit to you a uh, a written uh, uh, proposal like that and the name with the name can uh, will probably be changed to protect the innocent at some point or another but uh, the uh, whole weather in the cockpit uh, movement I think is uh, something that really needs to be touched and uh, one other thing Don Ike brought up yesterday about the uh, lack of augmentation uh, in surface mm -hmm. OBS and all that. And as much of a sticky wicket as that may be, that's not something uh, that I think should be left uh, untouched either because it is, as someone that was a, an observer and a manager, uh, it was an issue I saw across the NAS. 
Okay. Thank you. And if I type here and don't capture it, uh, at least from a high level perspective properly, please you know, point it out to me if I missed some important pieces here. I just want to create this list and then make sure we have kind of the key topics here captured and then we can start picking from that and see where we want to fit that in. Is that better suited for a spring meeting or a fall meeting, etc. Um, uh, Matthias, if I may, uh, two things. One administrative, um, one of our members had difficulties uh, accessing the chat screen. I, th I believe it was grayed out on his display. This happened yesterday also to uh, Joel Siegel. Uh, at the end of the day, what Joel did was to log out and log back in, and that fixed it, and it just, it just worked for Tom Ryan. So if any of you on your dashboard see features that are grayed out for unknown reasons, um, I might suggest that you log out and log back in. Regarding CDM in the cockpit and 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 what Matt just brought up, um, um, I can recall literally when I was still working at Delta Airlines, so this is now in the probably 2007-ish, maybe 2008 time period, uh, being at a meeting with Rocky and Joe Burns and Bill Lieber and myself and talking about CDM in the cockpit. And, and uh, there, were some, there were some very, very interesting um, um, positions on this. And, and I, I, don't, I don't think that necessarily these differing positions have been resolved in the interim 13, 12 or 13 years. Moreover, with TBO, um, right around the corner and with TBO requiring a level of engagement from both the um, dispatch side and the, the cockpit side that um, is much more significant than is typically the case today. I think that, um, that, that, that this topic in the weather arena would be a, a very, very interesting one. And it would also link in very nicely, I believe, to the weather integration uh, topic that you have up top, uh, Matthias, where you uh, call trajectory-based operation, flight planning optimization, et cetera. Okay, thank you, Matt. Any other thoughts, comments, suggestions? And I could be new topics or emphasizing things that are on the list. Hey, I just, this is Gary, I just sent in typing, but I can say it really quick. And I don't necessarily support this, but I bring it up as more listening to what I've heard in the past. And I know we heard a little of this to Randy this morning in our morning meeting, was that FPAW was trying to become more actionable. And I just kind of wonder for those meetings, if we shouldn't get, try to come up with at least with some objectives or something we'd like to come out of them before we sort of list topics to know like a theme or a goal or an objective. Because that was one of the a few of the comments in our morning meeting was people still kind of felt like we had really interesting discussions and then everybody went back to their desk. Yes, that is <laughs> a good point. I, I appreciate that, Gary, and we have been trying to do so. And in, in, in many ways, a discussion topic makes sense and we have to think in terms of where are we going with this? Is it just educational, you know, sharing of information for the group, for the benefit of individuals or organizations? Or where can we go a step further? And if there are opportunities to go a step further, we really would like to nudge those and 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 get that moving. But it's it's uh, not as simple as it sounds. No, and I realize it's not, but I guess where I'm going is, and we sort of talked about it, I know Eldridge brought up that some meetings, it would really be great, and maybe Steve Abelman would even agree to really, and actually John Cossack might too, would be one that springs in, we really focus on bringing pilots in, really hear what their problems are, and our goal is to identify what things pilots are complaining about at all levels, or maybe it's just 121, maybe it's 121, 135, and really let them know that the meeting is addressing them. And that's an objective is to inform the weather community of that. Maybe another one is more industry and their complaints on lack of documents or circulars or things for them 
to come up. Maybe, you know, like we heard with VWAS, that they want to know more earlier so they can get started and really get industry's gripes with both the FAA or other things so that there's sort of a general goal or objective, not so much, you know, like these committees that go to Congress or anything, but that there's groups that really, we know we're trying to hit something to turn, to get people to go do something, even if it's not setting the world on fire. That was just kind of some comments we heard this morning at our meeting. Um, um, You're free to ignore it. I just know you guys have talked about that. I remember John Cossack specifically saying that his boss was getting on him about going to these because he'd go back and just sit at his desk and nothing ever seemed to change. So <laughs> I, I'm so, just kind of reminding people what people have said we're trying to do before we sort of go back. Online became more PowerPoint. And I'm fine with it. I thought the meeting yesterday was really interesting, but with comments that have been made over the last year, it seemed like some of that sort of drifting off. And if that's the decision, I'm fine with it, but just kind of bringing it up. So, so Matthias, may I, may I jump in here? And then I'll, I'm going to uh, give Bill Watts a chance to, to, uh, to, to, to add some spin to this. Um, as far as yesterday and all remote, and Gary and I were conversing about this on the chat page there, um, you know, I, I I, I, I think we almost had to to drift to a more PowerPointy oriented um, um, pre presentations yesterday, simply because we, we we didn't exactly know how the actual oral conversation part of it was going to go. And you know, Dave was monitoring the chat room and kind of orchestrating, you know, the the asking of questions and the answers, and then we sort of tiptoed into. Um, you know, letting letting people unmute and and speak, and and as I as I mentioned, that that went that went very well, and I was I was very pleased with that, but I was also nervous as heck about how that was going to go. Um, as far as the as far as the um, you know the the age old, we sit around, we have interesting presentations, we talk to ourselves, and then we go back to our desks for six months until we have more interesting presentations and talk to ourselves. Um, you know, getting, establishing the, the vehicle, the means to, for, for FPA to express an opinion, to me has been one of the key missing pieces. And we talked about maybe FPA writing position papers or white papers, you know, things of that nature and, and um, and and Steve Dar and the ADS Weather V3 uh, native versus optional question was one of the first ones that kind of, in my mind, came up as um, as, as a good um, a, a, a a good case a use case to 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 take an F proposition and and then then <laughs> and only then and for me did the question of okay so how do we actually take a vote because there may not be agreement among all of FPA as to as to the, the correct position on this ADS whether version three native versus optional question. And 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 frankly I couldn't see my way clear at that point on how to do that. So when it came up last um, fall I guess at in Vegas or maybe it was last spring I don't remember I sort of wimped out on on doing something with it, and and therefore we 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 did nothing. But but where I'm going with this long-winded diatribe um, is that the the weather community of interest, which Steve Dixon specifically mentioned yesterday, is in the process of standing up, and I believe that FPA and the weather COI will over time have an organic relationship with one another where FPA will discuss, will, will perhaps um, take a position and even if it doesn't, will have feedback that naturally would funnel into the FAA's weather COI where, where a lot of further um, activities and actions could take place. And, and so let me stop there and I promise Bill that, that, that he could have a, a minute or two. Let me 
respond and then I'll let Bill real quick, Matt. I just, I'm talking even less than that. My feeling was if we had a general aviation day, AOPA might be interested enough to write articles about the meeting. If we had topics, I know Wittick has gotten AOPA to put some great articles out. When we do 121, the FAA Safety Magazine, they just March, April put out an entire issue almost all on research done by us. Those are all outreach that will get more people involved. But you, to get the writers of Aviation Magazine and things like that to come to the meetings, I think it's got to be a very focused thing where they can leave with something tangible to write about. So right now, you know, there might be one hour brief that affects just GA. And there isn't enough there. But those are all things that can impact the community that are not nearly as major as statement papers and position papers. That's much harder. But getting press by giving presentations that are very focused and getting writers and magazines that are in those areas to show up saying, we're going to be hitting topics your readers are going to like, I think is much more achievable. We, we have a D Dave Strand, can you do me a favor? Please? Yes, sir. W would you reprise reprise your 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 performance yesterday? The chat room is loaded up with people queued up that want to say something. <laughs> yeah, yes, I was going to ask if you wanted me to. Yes, please. But, but I, I know that since we're on the subject of the COI, that, that Bill, even though we have a couple ahead of him in queue, uh, Bill Watson, Gordy, we haven't forgotten you. Uh, maybe Bill Ballman could uh, go ahead and speak since we're on that subject. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I, I just wanted to add to what Matt was saying. And um, one of the, the terms that was proposed to um, John Croft, which is um, Steve Dixon's speechwriter who coordinated with Randy Bass and myself on uh, things for Steve to talk about. Matt, I think you used um, weather community of practice as a term from FPAW. And Steve didn't say that specifically yesterday. Um, he did talk about the COI, and I think from what I had heard from the time I joined the Weather Service back in 2015 was that everybody comes to FPAW and then goes home and does nothing about it. And I had organizations that I was a member of when I was on active duty called the Range Commanders Council, which was similar. The weather portion would get together every year, and the next year the same things would be discussed because it was volunteer and it was not people's job description. So they'd go back to their normal duty and nothing would get done. So I think the community of practice is a good idea from FPAW and also feeding the community of interest. And, and oddly enough, I was talking to Steve Bradford this morning about our uh, PLAs, our project level agreements, and how do we gather requirements from our non-ATM stakeholders? And he said, why don't you just use FPAW as one of your primary ways to gather requirements, feed the COI, and then have C6 involved with the other organizations working across the FAA. So, you know, we've we've got our chief scientist on board with this as well. So I think that's a good way to work towards solving the issue that folks have had in the past where we do meet and then when we come back six months later and talk about the same stuff. So I, I think that's part of it that may help solve that aspect of it. Well, that, that's great that um, that Bradford uh, saw that, uh, connected those dots there. So, Matt, uh, do you want to discuss this any more here uh, at this point, or do you want to move on to a couple of people that had some uh, comments prior to this uh, coming up? Matthias, if it's okay with you, I'd like to get these comments, and then maybe we can get back to the, the task at hand here. Yeah, and thanks for that, Bill. Uh, Bill Watts uh, had a comment earlier. Uh, yes, and first of all, Matt, uh, I'd like to thank the team for a job well done yesterday. Actually, I was very skeptical of the agenda for, as far as it uh, affected other sectors, but I thought uh, that when it was all said and done, to me, the major themes uh, coming out of that were data and presentation. And I, what's interesting to me is with the UAS community, I think you've got a tiger by the tail and I, I love it. And, and I think it's something that can be captured much like what uh, Bill just talked about. I even saw Rocky on here 
uh, and Gary, I think I think everybody's on the same page, and we can uh, we can leverage the fact that we can gather more data, and we need to to uh, to get the 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 things that force us. Uh, well, not force us, but force us away from solutions when we have these tight regulations. I think we can build on the what I call the E-WINS approval process versus supplemental. And we, we try to do that at, at the airlines and say, hey guys, this is what you have to look at, but here's supplemental. And then you can let that tiger out of the tank. And what I would like to see is very much what Bill just uh, described and in the fall rather than have a, a, a gr the, the, the topics that you've listed here is boil it down to data how you collect that data and how you use that data and then Gary brought up yesterday about presentation and by the way AOPA on their slides the second thing as far as the complaints for pilots in addition to more weather was presentation 17% uh, was the figure I remember. And I just think that if if you focus on getting more data, try not to lock it in because the, the USA, I mean, the UAS is, is going to take off and we better hang on and I love what they're doing. So that I'll, I'll close on that, but I do think that you've got to start, uh, build a task force if you have to out of FPAWS. You heard what Steve Bradford said, and I guarantee you Steve Dixon will get on board with that because he loves that kind of concept. So that's all I have. Great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Bill. Um, and Gordy, you had a comment uh, that came up right after uh, Bill had chimed in. So uh, why don't you go ahead, Gordy? Thanks, dude. Um, so I guess the comment really is, you know, the, and I agree with Gary, uh, things have to be actionable out of, out of FPA. Uh, you know, and I spoke to that last year when we met, uh, and Matt and Matias and myself and John have had discussions about, you know, what, how can you make uh, FPA more relevant? Well, Bill obviously just spoke to that. So, so, you know, FPA is the consortium of, of uh, like-minded minds. Uh, weather mines with, with different perspectives. Um, the thing that, you know, Gary, I just want to point out, we did get a lot of good feedback yesterday and we did get a lot of good support. I got emails supporting the uh, the VWAS. Uh, Mark Fanoff, uh, uh, you know, wants to help, you know, arrange the, the pilot feedback and Dempsey. Mark, thank you very much. We, you know, we will take you up on that. Um, but you also have to realize that the things that FPA has been talking about for years haven't gone on deaf ears. And there's been a lot of us working behind the scenes to kind of address this, uh, primarily in 400 and 200 with the folks in ANG. And, and I think the weather COI will help solidify that. You know, the, the, the AOPA's uh, concerns, the helicopter or ambulance uh, folk community has discussed the need for better weather observations. To, to me, that's, that is our number one focus. That really is our number one focus. And we brought Walter in um, and, and we, you know, we need the support we can get. And I think we're gonna get the support. I think we've got AOPA support. Uh, I know we've got the Alaska Air Carriers Association support. And, and, and so we, we are, we do get a lot of benefit out of that, Paul. We, we really do. I mean, I think, it's, I think it's gotten a lot better, but it's nice to hear that there will be a, a, a better focus and a, and a direct feedback to this weather COI. And I do agree with Bill on that. His idea of, of having Tiger teams or, or holding, you know, getting getting people involved in that. The UAS is the it, it is the it's the Wild West right now. Uh, it's the great unknown. But if if we don't do anything, we're going to be kicking ourselves, going, well, we should have done something earlier. And so a lot of good things came out yesterday. And if you remember back to Justin's comment, you know, he's looking for participation to help. And they're out on the forefront. UPS is out on the forefront of this thing, uh, as far as you know, being one of the first leaders to, to run commercially in, the, in these operations. And they're only going to get bigger. Um, but they they fully realize with their background that they don't have the all the information they need to, to safely do this. And so they're looking for help. 
So, I mean, I'm, I'm sure Kevin's listening and, and, you know, Kevin's got the, the role for the research in the UAS and there's, there's lots of things that we can do with the gap analysis that we heard about yesterday. So, or the gaps that are, have already been identified. Uh, it's just a matter of getting all the oars in the water um, and, and rowing the same direction. So, it's nice to hear everybody's still attending. I saw a great turnout yesterday. I don't know how many was, but at, at times I saw over way over 100 people uh, signed in. So I, I, I think there is a lot of uh, significant interest in in, um, in working together to make you know, as Scott put it, but build a better mouse trap. Um, so that's my comments. I, I appreciate those comments because it points towards benefits that are sort of hidden because you connect dots you have follow-up discussions among people offline essentially but the fpa meeting stirred this up and and so it's not necessarily trackable uh, like an article would be or a white paper or something like that but also important and and maybe most important that we get these kinds of connections going and uh, so, so how do we capture them and can get brownie points that we really facilitate that? So speaking up about such things is, is, is much appreciated. Thank you. And, and uh, I, I really, I appreciate that. And I would like to say that in the fall, however, wherever we meet, if we meet in Boulder or if we're meeting uh, you know, via Microsoft Teams again, um, that we, you know, provide update on where we're at with the whole VWAS uh, system, the discussions that we've had. I can tell you that there is there is pushback on development of such a system, and you know that is it, it's it's the fight we have to take up because we everything I heard yesterday was very positive on on the idea of expanding uh, weather reporting. To support, um, you know, aviation in general, and and really kind of to fix a lot of the forecasting issues, or, or not fix, but help them fix the forecasting issues that they currently are faced with in the state of Alaska. So yeah, I I would like to say that we will report, you know, uh, report back or or have a short 15 minute or something, just so that we don't lose track of what was done. Uh, Don had a comment, I assume, uh, in response to uh, some of Gordy's comments around that topic. So uh, you want to go ahead, Don? Yeah, no, I um, I just wanted to, to jump on the bandwagon that, you know, there's there's going to be different elements of, keep, of um, mm, entities that are going to, you know, help the whole here, right? One of them is, you know, the stand standards are going to get hopefully dealt with through ASTM now and we will be working with the FAA through that. So I don't think that needs to worry about specifically that other than being connected with it and understanding and having people um, on that ASTM committee that are also on FPAW and making sure we have cross pollination um, so that we have coordination. I think that um, the FPAW, you know, the focus, you know, data, like it was brought up earlier, right? That, you know, Alaska has all these gaps that they've been trying to close for years. For the UAS industry, those gaps are the same types of gaps Alaska has here in the United States. We just now have to, you know, we have to get more refined and finer about it. And I think the data piece is really important. And I think if FPAR takes that on as a, as a, as a calling, I think that would be huge. And of course, falling out from that are the research topics, are the, and I really, and what I wanted to add was the business model. I think, you know, I think, again, I know I keep harping on this, and I know I've had conversations with Steve myself, Bradford, about this. You know, there's not going to be money to pay for the infrastructure in the government. I mean, you get some money, but it's not going to cover the need. And I think what the FPAR can also do is, and I like this idea of tiger teams, right? So maybe one aspect of a, one tiger team is let's just talk about data. And, and work on understanding what the different types of gaps we have at, that already have been somewhat, you know, addressed with the MIT Lincoln Lab study, but, you know, maybe working on that a little bit deeper and how that impacts actual operations and then getting that feedback in from the pilots, um, you know, like you were talking about. But also, I think it's it's also around the, mo uh, the business model of how we can um, put forth a very um, bold, um, vision for how 
we can close these gaps in through public private partnerships through a business model that um, is sustainable and can grow uh, observations and improvements in prediction through you know data buys and um, you know things of that nature and I really I think you know if we if we don't solve that problem if we don't solve the money problem, the business case problem, then we can have all the meetings we want in the world to talk about this, but we're not going to have a way to execute because there's going to be, there's the money's not going to be there. So I, I just, again, I just want to drive that home. You know, um, if we want to really be effective, we kind of have to have, you know, the look at the gaps, the look at the research, the methods, and then we need to find a way to raise the revenue. And it, again, it's going to come through just the FAA. So that's, that's all I wanted to say. Okay. Thanks, Don. Uh, Rocky had a question, I assume, back to Gordy about where does the pushback against VWAS uh, come from? Well, it's, an, it's kind of an internal thing, and, and I'll be perfect last with it. It's, it's not any, from any one individual. I guess there's a, you know, there's a concern. And, and rightfully so. I mean, we have a system that uh, that works very well. I mean, yes, it has holes. Yes, it has gaps. Yes, it has limitations. Um, and and has, has provided pilots, operators, the appropriate information to safely conduct IFR operations down to the lowest minimums. I mean, it, it really does work well. The missing piece of this, it, it, and, and this is the vision that FPA and, and other meetings that I've had, is, is think beyond, you know, think beyond this and, and, and look beyond this. And that's that's one of the things that we have in our own uh, silos within the FAA. And there are many, and there are many, many silos within the FAA that, that, that deal with weather. John and myself and Scott come from the regulatory side. And, and I guess we're kind of where the rubber meets the road, right? However, you know, the other, the other, other elements of the FAA, the air traffic side, and, and all the other elements that 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 run these things, that that coordinate these things, that build these devices, that certify these devices, all those other divisions need to be on board. So the, the pushback isn't so much a, a, a disagreement that it's needed, but it's the vision of how it's going to be done. And 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 you know, I put in that, or Walter put in his presentation, and I hope I did it some justice yesterday. That we do have a uh, we do have a thought or an eye for uh, being a certified weather system. Um, we we know right out of the box that we already have documentation on non-certified AWASs, basically. So so there's already that documentation out there. However, those just those don't make the dollars and cents. They just don't meet the need, and and we need to fill a need in the state of Alaska. So. Yeah, the pushback is it's our own internal pushback. It's our own it's our own um, our own challenges. However, all the industry groups that are on here, all the I'll call them alphabet groups, everybody in here who's interested in weather that that likes the idea or can support the idea should support the idea. You know, you should be vocal about it. I agree, Gary. To, like for example, when we when we asked for the AAG product, we knew there was a forecast need product for the state of Alaska. We went up, we found 157 airports that were missing forecasts. Lo and behold, many of them didn't have weather observations. Uh, worked with uh, with Pat at the time, uh, and, and we, we drafted up a document to the National Weather Service. He said, how about we use Lamp, Lamp Boss? And it was like, well, we, we don't want to tell them, you know, what we want, and it, but in a roundabout way, we did. So we got together, worked with the folks in the Weather Service. It all worked out great. Took way longer than, than, it, than it should have, or we thought. And because of our slowness to 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 uh, to um, you know to, to produce the product, we ended up with legislation that that basically allows 121 and 135 carriers to operate without any weather. And I think most of the pilots and the safety people on this in this conference call would agree operating without weather is kind of ludicrous. I mean, it, it's kind of like saying, well, you know, go ahead, just y'all be safe out there. That's not the equivalent level of safety. So, you know, we continue to push forward. Well, is there, be is there a better mousetrap? And, and in our mind, the FAA has a responsibility to provide weather information. 
Now you take that to the UAS and Don and Don's comments yesterday. I, I I completely agree. We can't possibly fill the need for all the UAS. But what's that mouse trap going to look like? And and that's where I think FPAW has to come in and and help help uh, help make that determination. Of, you know the gaps and, the, and what's missing and so. So it's a long it's a long answer, but yeah, it's our own internal struggles. But I I, I think we'll get there. Yeah, going without weather, uh, flying without weather, it's kind of a, a closing your eyes and hoping you don't run into a wall at home. Um, in, that, in that comment, you know, it's it's interesting too because you know all these all these accidents, we get all the NTSB safety recommendations. We have to kind of mitigate all that. And, and Continental had a, a, a runway excursion that was an accident in in Denver. I'm think I'm sure you all remember it, but they weren't provided the the uh, wind gust information. They were provided the the wind information from the low level wind shear system, which was the closest to that runway and Denver's huge. So they thought they were providing the best information and the gusts were outside the crosswind to demonstrate a crosswind of the aircraft. So you think you're providing the best information, but really you step back and you go, well, you're not, you know, that that's not the, the appropriate information. I mean, they need all the information. And then you compare and contrast it to what's going on in Alaska. You know, now you're operating without any. It's kind of ridiculous. Uh, just, just an admin question right now. Matt is not on live video, uh, but his still photo is showing up instead of just initials. Does anybody outside of uh, somebody who's internal to MITRE does anybody see his still photo? It's just a, it's just as we're trying to piece this together. Does anybody see his picture? No, no this is Bill Bauman. I do not. OK, all right. It sounds like that the, that the still photos that somebody mentioned, I'm going to try to get some intel on that for future meetings uh, for people outside of MITRE, but it sounds like that the still photo is something internal to MITRE uh, with the Teams app. So anyway, uh, we appreciate that response, Gordy. Steve Abelman. Um, hope things are going okay at my old stomping grounds there. You had a comment that you wanted to say uh, in relation to this. Mute. Busy running the airline. No, I think I, I think I may have probably remuted him in the phone list. So if, if Steve, Perfect. if you go to the participant list and find your phone and unmute, <laughs> if that's what's happened. Well, Steve, we don't want to forget you. So uh, somebody probably came in and maybe grabbed them there. But uh, if, if you have a comment, just chime back in on the comment. Uh, oh, not muted on my end, he says. Try it again, Steve. OK. Um, Ask Steve what his cell, what his phone number is that he's calling in on. Well, how can he tell us? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you what. Um, you Added to the chat. Yeah. Let's, let's see, Steve Abelman. And there's not a way. Uh, hey guys, it's just can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. Three one five four zero oh, seven four. You know what, Matt? And I don't know if this is something you have control of, since you're the master uh, controller here. Uh, on the guest on the list, it shows many people as guests like Bill Bauman, uh, Bill Watts, and so forth. But for Steve, it shows him as outside your organization. Is there some, when you admit him to the meeting, is there something you can, oh, he I, just went away. I think he's Yeah, well, I, I, just, I just changed him. Uh, I just changed his status, Dave, from guest outside to um, attendee. And when I did that, he disappeared like a puff of logic. OK, well. Um, oh, there he is. He's looks here. Like, 
well maybe he'll he'll uh we we can figure out how to connect him back in here okay. um so yep. back back to you matt i think that was the last of it can you guys hear me now yes oh. uh, now he's unmuted well, i dialed in differently okay can you hear me now yes yes all right now so everybody in my office can hear me too which isn't the greatest way to do this but okay just one more sound check, Matt. Can you hear me? Five by five. Okay. All right. So I just wanted to go back to a couple of things. You know, first of all, what Bill said, I think, was maybe the most important thing that came out of yesterday's meeting to me was the COI coming back. I think, I think the ability for that group to get together to bring important topics to the table that again FPA can then look at, um, and I'll talk to that more in a second, it would, would be really good. Um, to Gary's point, though, and I and I think this is a point Gary and I have been pushing for quite some time. I, I don't believe that there's a need to um, limit the number of, you know, to limit what topics can be discussed. I just think there's a an issue that when we bring five or six different topics to the table for a single meeting, we, we can't get the user interest we, we need. And we've talked about that for a while now. So, you know, I think, you know, if we're going to focus in on topics that are UAS, for example, or data, or maybe something we haven't talked in a, about in a while, like forecast, you know, performance or things like that, that we're just not going to get everybody to attend. And, and personally, I'm okay with that. I mean, I'm okay yesterday that there was a UAS focus that, you know, wasn't as relevant to me in the American Airlines 121 world, but that that's okay. I mean, that's that's a topic, that's a hot topic. So I think that's a, that's a good thing for the future. And, and if the COI can guide FPA to take those topics, I have no problem with that. I will say though that we have to be careful what we are and what we aren't. We've we've tried for a long time, and I've been on this bandwagon to to let's get a charter, to let's get more actionable, to let's make sure we can do all these things that we thought we, we that we want to do. But it's very difficult to do that. And, and you know, to some of the points that Don made when it comes to budgeting and things like that, FBA has demonstrated over the past years that we do not do that well. And I don't know if. 50 people in a planning meeting will allow us to be able to do those things well with all the different interests we have. So I think we just have to be very cautious of how we approach this and and, and just continue to do like what, what you know, Gordy is saying, let's just continue to do some good things and, and, and get exposure going. Um, you know, again, I, we, I, I like the idea of putting together some sort of, I've always liked the idea of putting together some sort of limited steering committee where we have maybe just 10 or 12 people representing different sectors and that team meets on a regular basis and basically makes the makes the call as to what we will and will not cover um and and spreads it fairly i, I i've liked that for a while but anyway uh preaching a little bit that's my thoughts uh thanks all righty i think uh, that's all that was in queue there matt uh, back to you and Matthias. Okay, um, I'm going to hand it over to Matthias so we can come up with an agenda for the next fall. I have to point. Oh, geez. There's feedback in there. Do we have a ability, Matt, to poll people that they can vote or raise their hand on? You know, like we go through topics and say how much interest is in this area versus how much interest in a different area, because that will be a way to kind of see how the pile is starting to shape up. And and Matthias, unfortunately, unlike Zoom, which has raise your hand in polling, um, it appears at this instant yeah. in time that Microsoft Teams does not or that Matt Franzak's knowledge of Microsoft Teams is insufficient to answer that question. And, and you know what, Matt? Um, because you and I talked about this last night after the meeting was over. Let me ping the um, the guru, see if I can get her um, like right now. Uh, so if I can just bow off the meeting for, I mean, I'll stay connected, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, go elsewhere and try to get a hold of her and see if that exists uh if i can get a hold of her right now just in case because you you and i neither one have been able to find it but yeah. there's lots of stuff buried in microsoft yep yeah. so i'll be back in about uh five minutes here 
So we'll find out, Matthias. Meantime. Yeah, so are there other topics that uh, are not on this list? I mean, the list becomes bigger and bigger, or are there some things we really want to flesh out? I mean, if I look at this and what I heard, there's clearly things related to data, use of data, visualization that people are interested in, but that also relates to decision making decision making under uncertainty, and that could be from the cockpit or it could be from another perspective. Uh, the weather community of interest is clearly there, but I think it could also be a driver in terms of the topics that FPAR should be discussing. As, as Steve pointed out, the UAS uh, urban air mobility, that kind of is clearly in many people's mind, but it's, it's a topic that doesn't you know, interest everybody. And so I think I would like to entertain a mixed bag of topics that attract is attractive to many people. And, and so it, it, it's not straightforward how to do that because it ultimately boils down to someone standing up saying, yes, I run with this and I help organize a session. And that's how these things start moving forward. So in some ways, I would also like to see if there are people who see certain topics here that are really dear to their hearts and that they would like to step up and say, I want to put something together on this and then see if other people chime in and say, yes, I'm going to help you with that, etc. So can we get some voices here from the audience to see if there are some things that float to the top based on such an approach. And either speak up or through the chat room. Matt, you would have to monitor the chat room. I don't see it today. Yeah, I, I, I will do so, um, Matthias, and I, I have it up right now. FYI, for those folks um, who would like to participate in the chat, but that symbol is grayed out on your dashboard. It would appear that logging out and logging back in fixes that. I don't know why that is, but we've had at least two people in this meeting who have commented that that was what they were looking at and that that's how they fixed it. Matthias, this is Steve Dar. Uh, yes, sir. I'll uh, Go ahead and say that I would be uh, willing to help put together uh, an observation or data driven session. Uh, there's uh, you know, a couple of years ago we talked about space weather. Um, there was some talk last year about maybe um, uh, renewing that. Um, I know of a company out in Seattle that's doing some really interesting forecasting of space weather. Uh, which I think would be more germane than some of the presentations we had uh, on on its effects um, last time. So, you know, a session that went from the ground to the sun on uh, observations and forecasting uh, might be something that I could help uh, with. I would need some help to do that, but I'm uh, I'm available. Okay, I need to change this here. Any other thoughts while I am trying to get here in? Okay, weather observations from ground to space. Is that what you said, Steve? Something like that? Something like that, yeah. <clears throat> Something like that, yeah. Okay. Any other volunteers, topics?
Mike Robinson, what's on your mind? <laughs> you must have saw me somehow just kind of sitting here and stewing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, the thought that was on my mind, Matthias, was as we're all sitting at home right now, is we're in this great pause, right? And sometimes pauses offer opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if, if you know, and this is expected to probably persist or maybe kind of, even if we come out of this, we're going to be in some type of new normal in terms of our, the operation of our national airspace system and stakeholder operations. And I'm just wondering if that offers opportunities to test weather advances and innovations that otherwise would not be possible in our go, go, go old normal. Um, I don't really have a, a, a firm idea around this, but it's just something that was just in my mind today. And it's not necessarily related to like climate change, although it, we can certainly go there. But again, something where as we get reset, we being the NAS, um, um, the way we travel, um, and, and the, the, the time it's going to take for us to recover, um, sometimes, you know, things slow down and offer opportunities for us to test things that have always been kind of off limits or maybe a bit too far of a reach. And it's not just, I think, conventional or commercial aircraft. I think this is true with UAS. We see what's going on with, you know, Google Wing having significant increases in, 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 in their operations, um, and, and requests for their op demand for their operations. Um, just something across the, the the great pause that may provide opportunities in, in our aviation and aerospace weather domain that um, is worth kicking around. And I'm sorry, I don't have it more firmed up than that. Can we put your name down to keep you thinking about those lines? That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, well, Mike, I, 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 I really appreciate that thought, uh, thinking out of the box, and I know your plate is full, like many other people's plates are full, and, but, but I appreciate that, and, and thinking and kicking this around, and uh, I'll be happy to help you. Sounds good, Matthias. <laughs> Two guys with no bandwidth working on a project <laughs> together, great. <laughs> Hey, let, let me let me join in. I'll help you too. Now we got three guys with no bandwidth ready to go. It's funny uh, that three of us have tried this before. <laughs> yeah, it seems that we have. Uh, hey, any, Abel, uh, any, on the chat, more uh, time. Right. Oh, sorry. sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Steve Abelman on the chat uh, says, if there is interest, I'll lead a session um in this topic i believe i mentioned at the last planning meeting to consider a state of the forecasting science review what are we doing better than 10 to 20 years ago what still needs to improve and yes gary we need to make this relevant not just, just to meteorologists but understandable to users too relevant to uas to ga and to 121s and then matt Eckstein from delta chimed in and said he likes that concept but he would also like a desired state in 10 to 20 years module. That's an interesting. So where have we come from 10 to 20 years ago and where do we need to go 10 to 20 years into the future? And just to clarify state of forecasting, just weather or also traffic demand and other things? Well, uh, in my opinion, I think it's probably weather focused, but we can maybe look at, you know, where the other impacts could be. But I think just 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 getting a handle on what you know it, it, the the UAS stuff yesterday made me really think about you, you know do we have a handle on what percentage better our forecasts are now ten years ago than the, you know what are better now than they were ten years ago and how much better do they have to be ten years from now to be able to meet the needs of the UAS community and that, but I think it starts with what we're doing well today because even today I frequently get questions about you know, our, our, well, I think the perception of our forecasts, well, they might be a little better, but are they really better? But I think we have statistics to show that meteorologically, our, our, our convective weather forecasts, our turbulence forecasts are so much better than they were 15 years ago, but it's very difficult to quantify it. Be interesting to 
to present that to the right people and be able to, to then then reach out to that next step of where we need to be in the UAS world. And and why we don't know how much better we are today or not as much. I mean, we can quantify it on a forecast perspective, but it plays also how that information is used in a decision making process. And that's a much harder uh, characterization and quantification to see how much difference a forecast improvement of Delta X, how much difference on Delta Y on, on the decision making side that makes. That That is difficult to, to measure. Agreed. So that would certainly be an interesting topic to try to reach out in that direction if you can, Steve. I, I do, I have some ideas. Okay, uh, that 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 sounds very interesting. I, I'm and I'm I'm now doing the uh, the, the chat monitoring. So, uh, and we get we've had some folks uh, chime in. So let me continue, if I may, please, Matthias. Uh, Andy McClure has uh, says that it has been suggested that if we if we revisit the pirate subject, I would help. I would like to help organize it. I would suggest there is value in the topic but perhaps it should be organized at a higher level like an FAA ATO top five office with participation from the weather folks, air traffic, weather cams, flight standards and more. And, and let me just reply to that uh, straight directly to you, Andy. Right before the call today, um, I along with uh, Bob Abgen from MITRE were talking to the folks from CAMI um, about, um, about linking up uh, their efforts, our efforts, and the and the top five, the FAA's uh, AJI um, top five uh, efforts in the in the CAP program. And um, my sense is that that we we have actually put together a uh, what I hope is an effective linkage, and that um, um, that that this this topic will be probably. Um, focused within that uh, AJI top five cap program um, slash uh, weather COI depending on how it actually evolves with respect to the PIREP topic. And so it's not that I don't want it or don't think that it belongs in FPA, but uh, it feels to me like there is a move afoot where there are going to be a couple of other organizations with Pyrex Square in their bullseye, that that may be may be more appropriate than Fpro. Hey Matt, this is okay. Randy. So sorry, heard too. Uh, Andy, do you want to you want to reply to what I said? Um, no, I'm I'm interested in the effort. Um, I hadn't heard about that in particular, but uh, yeah, I'm I'm open to uh, you know any possibility at this point. Uh, yep. I just want to see it move forward. Okay. Hey Matt, this is Randy. Hey Randy. Hey, I, I actually met with uh, Katrina Avers and uh, Daniela uh, last month when I was, just before they closed all the travel, I was down at uh, in Norman in Oklahoma City and I met with them specifically about the uh, uh, the PIREP thing. And, and the plan was, they were going to have a PIREP summit in June um, out at uh, uh, OKC uh, to uh, and bring everybody in that's, you know, basically an end to end PIREP session. Uh, so, yeah, I would obviously that's probably not going to happen then, but I would I agree. I think you should just uh, we should let them handle that and uh, participate in theirs instead of making it a, a, a session here. Yeah, and and you know things may evolve in such a way that 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 you know that the the topic comes whizzing right back around the corner into into FPA. But at this particular incident in time, my sense is that we've got a couple of of um, you know a couple of two three organizations syncing up now and trying to work it. And um, I think well, several of us are in those other. Um, efforts and so the, the 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 connectivity provided by those of us who um, are are in the multiple efforts I think is important but but I, and I think it's there so I'm not overly concerned about it um, about getting you know disconnected or out of sync at this point in time um, 
Rocky Stone says, I would like to lead, I like Rocky's panels too. I would like to lead a panel on the use of newly available graphic weather information in the cockpit. How can it be used to positively impact the NAS? Mark Faniff says, I second that motion, Rocky, and would like to help. No, no Matt Tucker would like to help also. And Matt Tucker too. See, I think it sounds, that panel could... sounds to me like a, a flavor of the um, Matthias, the the item that you had in your kind of master list about uh, about cockpit CDM, about weather in the cockpit, and 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 how in the TBO environment, you know, may, maybe roles evolve, expectations change, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I would think Rockies could go with Steve and they could also hit what Matt put up there, the idea of what's needed in the future, that the two together, are what's missing and what data is lacking and why, and get the user community in there, that you'd have two groups that sort of complement each other, that Steve could cover the forecasting and they could identify why it's short, where it's not working, what types of, for, and for all classes of aviation, you know, what, what's missing in the forecast, what's needed to years down. Well, I, I agree with that, Gary, and, but you're also raising issues that, you know, how, how is the aerospace system going to change around us to accommodate this new information or to accommodate things that we'd like to do with this new information? So well, that's, not, yeah. that's probably the third group. How's it going to change over the next 10 or 20 years? And then put all three. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But it seems like I, I like Matt's idea that some of it is sort of looking ahead, not just what's where it's at, but really what's needed. And if you're having a group on going over it with some users, both pilots and ground like Matt, that that could help identify where they're meeting or where data is needed or what data to make it better for them. It seems like you two could complement in some manner. I agree. You got to know what's going to happen to the airspace. I mean, that's that's certainly a valid point. Since we have at least three mats on this call, I would appreciate a, a surname to help me understand which mat is being referenced. <laughs> um, the other thing that, that strikes me um, as this conversation is going on is that these little one-liner sessions feel to me like they're about eight hours each. And I don't know how, how we fit this into um, a day and a half FPA, let alone a one day FPA, should we end up doing this virtually and have to deal with time zones again? Matt, Matt Franzak, should we take a, you know, 15 minute break? We have spent now an hour and a half and just let it settle. And maybe you and I can kind of converse on what I have here on this slide, whether I captured really names and topics properly, and then come back in about 15 minutes and try to see if we have a few additional things that have surfaced as people had time to think about it, and then start trying to map it into the fall and spring meetings to see how it shapes up. That works for me, Matthias. Uh, by the way, on your list there, um, Jose uh, Garcia from IMSG said that he would be happy to help Steve with uh, with his session as well. This one? Yes, sir. Thank you, Jose. And I thought there was a third one here too, but I couldn't remember the name while I was typing in with Rocky Stone. Um, Mark Faniff. Yeah, Mark Faniff, yeah. Oh, yeah. okay, thank you. And, and and with Steve, you should probably put my brother, Matt Eckstein. He didn't volunteer, but he did make a good enough comment that he, I, I would like to volunteer him then. Who? Mike? Matt, another Matt, my brother, Matt Eckstein. E-C-K-S-T-E-I-N. E-C-K... S T E I N. Okay, thank you. So, should we take a 15 minute break, Mac, and then come back at maybe 10.45? Ah, what is that? At 12.45 East Coast. <laughs> yes, 
how about as as uh, as um who was it that said oh jack, jack may yes yeah, right. right. just use zulu time and i said jack you're showing your age now man if you're calling it zulu time <laughs> So we'll be back at 1645 Z.